Well, hello, and welcome to worship. Today we are continuing our worship series, Love in Action. Now, last week we saw that love carries a cross in Jesus' name as he carried for us the cross that won our salvation. And today we see that love leaves no one behind. When a brother or sister in Christ is caught in, caught in sin and struggling with sin, Christian love demands that we speak not in self-righteous judgment, but in love that desires for them to find forgiveness at the Savior's cross. If you'd like to follow along with the order of service, you can find a link to the worship folder in the video description uh, just below this video. God's blessings on your worship. And we'll begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful. We have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us. Amen. The Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we'll continue with our scripture lessons. In our Old Testament lesson, the Lord tells Ezekiel to be a watchman for the Lord's people, warning them of the dangers of sin. We read from Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 7 through 11. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel, so hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. Son of man, say to the Israelites, This is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? This is the word of our Lord. In our second letter, we see that love compelled the Apostle Paul to call to Peter, also known as Cephas' attention, uh, the danger of his sin of showing favoritism. We read from Galatians chapter 2, I'll read verses 11 through 21. When Cephas, or Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles 
because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This is the word of our Lord. Our gospel lesson for today comes from Matthew chapter 18. I'll read verses 15 through 20. And the gospel lesson will serve as the basis for the sermon message. Jesus says, If your brother or sister sins, Go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every manner may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, Nemo residio is a Latin phrase that is known and appreciated by by armed forces all across the world. It it translates in English as, leave no one behind. The U.S. Army Rangers, they reflected in their creed that says, I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into enemy hands. And I I believe the the Marines and the U.S. Air Force, they, they reflect a similar sentiment in their creeds as well. Leave no one behind. That's an idea that that is as old as warfare itself. I have never served in the armed forces, but but if I had, I think that that saying this creed and and knowing it, I I think that that would really encourage me. It's this reminder that, that no matter what happens out there, no matter how bad it gets, I will not be left behind and abandoned by my unit. It's a reminder for them that they are a unit. And that while, yes, they are fighting for their country, but, but they're also fighting for one another. Well, in the Christian church, we don't have in any of our creeds that exact phrase, nemo residio. But it certainly is biblical. And in fact, we see Jesus prescribing this attitude within his church. When it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ and the spiritual warfare that we are engaged in, in love, we leave no one behind. Our gospel lesson, it, it, it reads almost like this how-to guide on what to do when a brother or sister in Christ is caught in and struggling with sin. Jesus gives his disciples and us these, these step-by-step instructions on, on what to do to call them from sin to forgiveness. And Jesus begins by saying, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. 
Now clearly this is referring to sin that, that is evident and open and ongoing. Now, this isn't really referring to this, this momentary lapse in weakness, but this is sin that is, that is persistent, that must be addressed for the sake of their soul. And step one, Jesus says, is to go and show them their fault just between the two of you. Right, don't go and get others involved. In love, we want to keep the matter as small and in private as, as possible. And so, of course, it also means then that we're not going to go and gossip about it and tell other people. It also means that our first reaction isn't going to be to go and, and tattle on them to the pastor or, or, or elders. No, Jesus is very clear. First, you go. It is your responsibility. And then Jesus says, well, if they listen to you, then you have won them over. When a person who is stuck and caught in sin listens to your word of warning, well, then you have regained a brother or sister in the faith. And, you, and they will have been spared from, from that, that eternal death of their soul. But of course, it's possible that, that they will not listen to you, that they will not hear that rebuke from God's word. In which case, then, Jesus says, well, go and bring one or two others along with you. And I should mention here that, that we're not necessarily told that we must follow these these, these steps in mechanical fashion, that we just must go right from step one to step two. Right? In love, sometimes maybe we need to be more patient and we'll go back a step. Right? We'll do a step multiple times. But in general, Jesus says then step two is go and bring one or two others along with you. Now, bringing one or two others with you, that can have a number of advantages. First of all, it's more arms to put around that shoulder of that brother or sister in Christ who is struggling with sin, to show them that that their family of believers cares about them. And bringing others and getting others involved can also help because, well, we realize that we can be rather stubborn. And so if someone is coming to me to, to, to confront me in my sin, to use God's law to tell me what I'm doing isn't right, my first reaction might be to be very defensive and to insist, no, you're wrong and I'm right. But if there's others involved and I'm outnumbered, well, it starts to become a little more difficult to convince myself that I'm right. But of course, even still, they might not listen. And so in that event, Jesus says, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. Finally then, the matter, it is brought before the entire church, the assembly of believers. But of course, even still, the idea here isn't to give them public shame and humiliation but it's to show them and demonstrate for them the seriousness of their sin. But even still, it's possible that the devil would have such a hold on their heart that they might not listen even to the church. In which case, the final and decisive step is taken by the church. Jesus says, And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, this final step, it is meant to be the strongest possible preaching of the law. When, when they refuse to hear God's word, when they choose to continue to persist in their sin, well, then they have separated themselves from the grace of God. They have chosen to, to crawl back into the darkness from which they have been called out of. And sadly, by their own actions, they are no longer a brother or sister in faith. And so we should not so deceive them by treating them as if they, they were. Now, this does not mean that we throw rotten fruit at them. It does not mean that we call them names or, or, or send them out as outcasts of society. But it means that we treat them as though they are lost, because in fact now they are. But we also realize that we are to love the lost. Right? That we love the lost just as Jesus first loved us. That we reach out to the lost just as God reached out to us. And we continue to pray for them. But we will not, in love, contribute to them feeling comfortable in their sin by just continuing to carry on with them as if that sin weren't present in their lives. This is, this, this is the duty, this is the obligation that Jesus tells us that we have toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
and it's an important one. But why then don't we always carry it out? You know, why, why are we sometimes negligent in these responsibilities? You know, I think there's probably a number of reasons, a, a whole bunch of different varieties of excuses that might be given. And I'd like to address just, just a, a few of them. You know, I think one big excuse that is given, one reason as to why I don't want to get involved when a brother or sister in Christ falls into sin, is to say, well, I don't want to be judgmental. Right? It's really none of my business. I should stay out of it. And in fact, we can convince ourselves that when a brother or sister in the faith is, is caught in sin, that that's the loving thing to do for them, is just to stay out of it, mind their own business, and don't get involved. We can convince ourselves that's the loving thing. But the question is really, well, what does God say is the loving thing? You know, my, my two older children, they really love their baby brother. But they don't always really know how to show love to their baby brother. In fact, oftentimes it seems as though they think the best way to show love to their brother is to constantly poke him and prod him and to aggressively shake toys an inch away from his face. And so my wife and I have to constantly tell them, no, this is how you show love for your baby brother. Well, here God is telling us, this is how you show love to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And God forbid that we should be so arrogant to say, I don't know, God, that doesn't sound right to me. That sounds kind of judgmental. It's really none of my business. No, God is telling us here, it is your business. God says to you, I have made it your business. You must get involved. You must speak. And in fact, our, our Old Testament lesson from Ezekiel, it, it shows us just how much so God has made it our business. God told Ezekiel that if you remain silent and you say nothing, I'm holding you accountable for their sin. If a brother or sister in Christ is caught in sin and we say nothing, well, then we have left them dead in their sin. Another common excuse or reason that might be given to be negligent in our responsibility is to say, well, I have my own sins. I have my own sins, and, and so I can't really help people with theirs. But of course, if being a sinner disqualified us from talking to other people about sin and grace, well, then the only person who's walked on this earth who could have those conversations would be Jesus. You know, being a sinner does not disqualify us from this responsibility. But it does remind us that when we do go and we do speak, well, we go in humility. And then finally, I think the biggest reason why we might be tempted to be negligent in this, in this duty, in this responsibility, is simply that well, we tend to be too casual about sin just in general. We just don't see it as that big of a deal. It's not really that much of a problem, we think. At least not big enough of a problem that I'm going to so inconvenience myself and, and willingly put myself in that uncomfortable situation where I'm talking to someone else about sin. But if we could see sin as God sees it, if we could see the hold that the devil has on this person's heart and soul and that the devil would drag them down to hell if that hold continued, well, then we would say, I don't care how uncomfortable the conversation is. I must speak. I must say something. Love in Christ for them demands it. But even still, this isn't an easy thing to do. It's not, isn't it? It's much easier just to ignore the problem. It's much easier to just say nothing and just turn a blind eye towards it. So why do we speak? What is our motivation here? Well, to go back to that example of the soldiers, you know, I think part of their motivation for leaving no man behind is that they would like to think that their brothers in arms would do the exact same thing for them. Well, and that's certainly part of our motivation as well. You know, we seek to help out a brother or sister in Christ who is caught in struggling with sin because we would like to think that if the roles were reversed and when we are struggling and caught in sin, that our brothers and sisters in Christ, they would do the same thing to help us. We realize that, that in this spiritual warfare that we are engaged in against the devil, that we are better equipped for that battle when we are looking out for one another. 
But the biggest reason, the biggest motivation we have to look out for our brothers and sisters in Christ and to leave no one behind is because we remember that Jesus did not and would not leave us behind. Jesus did not turn away from our problem and say, that could get messy, that could get ugly, it's really none of my business, it's not my problem to get involved with. We're far from it. Right, Jesus, he immersed himself in our mess. Jesus made our problem his own problem, quite literally. Jesus took sin, our sin, upon himself. He became sin for us. And for our sin, he died. For all of it, all sin, every sin. For all of our failures to, to be our brother and sister's keeper, as we should. For all of the sins that we ourselves might be struggling with and needing to be called to repentance for. And of course, for all the sins that our brothers and sisters in Christ happen to be struggling with, Jesus died for all of them. So that for all of them, no matter what, no matter the sin, none of us would be left behind. And there's a, a picture of God in the Bible that is among my favorites. And I'm guessing I'm not alone in this. But it's the picture that God gives us of himself in the parable of the prodigal or lost son. After all that son had done to hurt and to wrong his father, after all that time he had spent in that immoral living and debauchery, after blowing through the family inheritance, the father never stopped loving his son, never stopped waiting for him to return back home. And when that prodigal or lost son finally came back to his senses and returned back home, what was the father doing? He was there waiting for him. He saw him out in the distance, and when he sees him, he runs out to him, and he, and he throws his arms around him, and he hugs him. And then that son, remember, he starts going through his plan on how he's going to pay his father back, how he's going to make up for what he had done wrong to his father. He starts going into this plan, and his father stops him. He, he cuts him short. He's not going to hear any of it. Because the father isn't welcoming his child back because his son has this payment plan in place and, and now he can atone for the wrong he has done. The father isn't welcoming the son back because what the son did really wasn't that bad in the first place. No, the father welcomes his child back because he loves him and he forgives him. He is overjoyed to have his son back and so he says, let's throw a feast, let's celebrate. For the son of mine is lost and now he is found. That is the kind of father that we have. A father who is eager to forgive us and eager to restore us, no matter the sin, no matter how long we've been astray. We have a father who rejoices when his children return back home. We're told that there is a celebration in heaven among the angels. And to think that God would use you and me to help reach out to the lost and straying. To think that God would use your efforts and mine to call his sons and daughters back home into his arms. And we have courage and we have hope as we carry out this battle, this warfare against the devil and his temptations. We have many reasons for hope and courage, but one of them is that we know that should we fall, that we have been blessed with brothers and sisters in Christ who will not remain silent, who will not stand idly by. Christian love demands that we speak. For love leaves no one behind. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue by confessing our faith together. And today we'll, we'll use Luther's explanation of the third article of the Apostles' Creed. And again, you can find this printed uh, in that worship folder in the link below. We confess. I believe that I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. 
In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and fully forgives all sins to me and all believers. And on the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. And we'll continue with prayer. Merciful and gracious God and Father, we implore you to turn the hearts of all who have forsaken the faith they once embraced, all those who have wandered from it, who are in doubt about your truth. Mercifully touch their hearts and restore them, so that they may wholeheartedly take pleasure in your word, which alone can make them wise for salvation. Help us to carry out our responsibility to the lost and the wavering, and prevent us from becoming comfortable in silence and complacency. Motivate us by your undeserved love for us, by which you found us and saved us when we were lost. Help us to carry out this work in all humility, knowing that all of us need your blood and your righteousness. Almighty God and merciful Father, our ever-present help in trouble, we pray for all those who are being affected by the forest fires out west, be with the firefighters and rescue personnel and bless their work. Do not let the hearts of your people despair, but sustain and comfort them. Heal the injured, console the bereaved and afflicted, and protect the helpless, and deliver all who are still in danger. And we join together in the prayer which Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <clears throat>